the business and benefits of biohacking. I'm Tanya Hall and joining me is Tim Chang, partner at Mayfield Fund. Welcome, Tim. Thanks for having me. What is the mission of the Mayfield Fund? So our tagline at Mayfield Fund is people first, investing in people first. And this is uh, because when we got started, when the venture capital industry began in the 50s and 60s, it was all about recognizing entrepreneurial talent. And our founder, Tommy Davis, had this saying that people make products, products don't make people. So really, as cool as the technology or business plan sounds, at the end of the day, you're betting on talent people. And so we've tried to keep that focus, that historical focus on looking at who we're betting on and letting them figure out the market currents. Because one thing in common all startups have, they pivot, they learn, they adapt, and nothing ever in the original business plan ends up panning out to be what the business usually is in the end. And that's what's fascinating. One of your personal areas of interest is biohacking. Define that term for, for some of us who may not know what that means. So I think biohacking was born out of the so-called quantified self movement, you know, 10, 15 years ago. These are folks like Gary Wolf and Kevin Kelly. Tim Ferriss popularized it. And it was the notion of, hey, how do you take an engineer's or geek-like attitude towards optimizing your fitness? And it's by measuring your biomarkers and your blood sugar and seeing how many calories you can burn and the most effective workouts. So sort of maximum results for minimal effort. Now, keep in mind, these are like engineers and geeks, not gym rats or fitness nuts. So it was sort of a way to try to hack the system. What were shortcuts to get great results? I got into it because I got into fitness much later in life. And as I went down that rabbit hole, I realized that actually a lot of it was about nutrition. And so there's a saying that abs are made in the kitchen, not the gym. So much of it actually relates to what you eat, when you eat, how you eat. And that kind of took me down that rabbit hole of analyzing that sort of area. So maybe it was food hacking first, but then it also led to how you get the most results for a minimum amount of workout. Uh, and then uh, I learned that it was very much kind of like a meditative practice. It was about analyzing the data, understanding your habits, shaping your habits, forming them uh, with routine and discipline each day. And um, that actually took me to this notion of considering, well, hey, what does a six pack for your mind, your emotions, your spirit look like? And to my surprise, a lot of these practices applied for that as well. If you wanted to look at maybe hacking your consciousness or hacking your emotions or your soul, like the notion of wellness goes well beyond just the body. This has taken big interest uh, to a lot of pioneers in technology, a lot of tech people that are investors, um, not just VCs, but just people across Silicon Valley. In fact, you and I talked about Phil Libin earlier, who's very mm -hmm. interested in this space as well. What are some of the products that have come about through this interest, uh, products, maybe apps that are actually leading the market right now? Absolutely. So we've got apps like Headspace and Calm, Simple Habit in the meditation space. Um, a company of mine I backed a long time ago, Lumosity, was doing brain training games. We've got apps like Zero that help with your intermittent fasting. Um, we've got sleep tracker apps, all these things to help you quantify and then shape your habits. On top of that, there's been a revolution also in supplements and the nutraceutical market. So we've got everything from nootropic jelly beans to nootropic gum that you can chew with uh, smart drugs, so to speak. And and then uh, a big, big interest in these sort of new food products that help you get into ketosis, right? Um, as well as like power drinks with all sorts of herbal supplements. So it's an interesting match of like old and new. Some of these contain, you know, Ayurvedic herbs as well as the new cutting edge sort of nootropic stacks. Um, none cleared by the FDA because this is the supplement world, but people are hacking and experimenting around with these things because they're interested in getting sort of more performance for what it is they eat and drink and getting more balanced, more grounded. You mentioned a lot of different areas, including okay. sleep. And, and uh, Philippe Kahn, for example, has done a lot of research with his company and monitoring sleep and understanding sleep. How important is sleep as a part of this bigger idea of, of fitness and, and wellness? And I mean, we're all overworking, right? I mean, none of us really yeah. sleep anymore. It's fundamental. I actually think sleep coaching sleep tracking, personalized sleep tracking and sleep coaching will be the next big market. It's something people are realizing is an epidemic that we're all suffering. If you ask most people, they will tell you they don't sleep enough and they probably don't sleep well enough. Um, there are applications like the Aura Ring that you can wear around the clock to help you understand your sleep phases. I wear it all the time and what's really depressing is 
wow, how efficient my sleep is not. Even though you might be in bed seven hours a day or a night, you might only be getting actually four and a half, five hours of actual sleep. That leads to questions of how can I tune my sleep? How can I get proper REM and deep sleep phases out of that? So this will be a big market that emerges. Everything from AI-based self-cooling beds by different zones to different supplements you take at night, different types of magnesium, et cetera, time to help you with better sleep cycles. Um, sleep is so foundational, I'll say, you know, you can take all of the anti-aging advanced supplements you want, but if your sleep isn't dialed in, that's like worrying about your roof tiles when the foundation of the house isn't well built. Mick, that's a good analogy. Um, you know, from the standpoint of biohacking, is genetic ear engineering involved in any of this? Not yet. All the people are starting to look at potential applications of this. You know, we've read stories of CRISPR editing, you know, babies and those sorts of things, which lead to potentially a lot of unintended consequences. But what people do use genetics for today is more of the genetic sequencing to understand what is the blueprint of their genetic house and what are the different things that could express or not based on their lifestyle. Genes are not destiny. They will tell you what you might have proclivity towards, but they can give you clues as to how to tune your lifestyle to ensure that some of those uh, genes do or do not express, right? And so these days we've got the 23andMe test, which will tell you, hey, you're 23% related to Genghis Khan or something. But the more actionable ones are functional gene testing, which might indicate, I'll give you an example. I found that I have low BDNF in my brain wiring. That means I'm really good at focus and productivity. But what it also means is when I come into emotional, stressful times, my brain will enter this sort of hamster wheel cycle, replaying something over and over and over again. You know, so imagine like getting an argument with somebody that's uh, really stressful and then thinking, man, why did he say that? Oh, maybe I should have thought of this way. Maybe I should have tried that. Maybe I should have drawn this other approach. So, you know, that's an example of how sometimes our genes lead to different tendencies of how our brains are wired which could affect everything from how you relate to other people, how you communicate, your addictive patterns, maybe even your success ratios and the type of people that you enter in love relationships with. So imagine the future Tinder based on this sort of gene profiling say, you know what, you're a serotonin junkie. You're gonna want a lot of touch. This person is not, they're wired a different way. So you're you know, asking for cuddles all the time is gonna drive, drive them nuts. Asking for cuddles. I love it. I think that's a show title. So <laughs> I have to say, you stopped using voicemail roughly a decade ago, but now there are so many messaging apps that can really, you know, t pull us in, right? So yeah. what kind of effect do these apps have on our brains and our health? I actually think we're going to look back and realize how damaging these were. My new saying is that messaging apps are mind killers. And the reason I say that, average person probably has three to five messaging apps um, having multiple parallel dialogues with the same people across them all. Um, on top of that, the little red meat balls and notifications that pop up constantly interrupt you. And they even show when the messages are read, when somebody has read it, wh how, when they're responding or typing, that leads to this illusion that they're always on in real time. This is not good because it gives the expectation that the people are always live on the other end, and it can cause you to create stories if somebody takes like three hours to reply to your message. Do they not like me? Are they purposely ignoring me? What's going on, right? So I think that it's, it's pretty dangerous that we have these seemingly always on multiple message platforms and the expectations and room it creates for stories in your head um, and expectation of always being available is something that's pretty dangerous for the mind. My friend Adam Mazzali, UCSF neuroscientist, has written much about the distracted mind, but now he's writing about the coming cognitive crisis when we have all of these overly connected apps and the distraction and um, actually the depression it can cause with that expectation. Interesting. Okay. On a personal level, I wear glasses. So I have mm. to ask, how, how is the eyeglass industry being disrupted? Eyeglasses? Wow. Well, we've got quite a few new innovations. We've got blue blockers, right? And we've got now uh, probably glasses for nighttime. We'll have ones that reduce glare. Um, we're going to be seeing smart glasses now with uh, AR projection and everything else there. The next, you know, future versions of Google Glass will probably be what takes imagined information projected in real time onto the lenses as to, wow, this person's a type 3 Enneagram or you have these five friends in common. This person's birthday just came up. So overlay info real time will be something that we'll expect to see, I think, in these eyeglass formats or the next several years. But even from the health perspective, 
more personalized, smarter glasses. Um, I'm seeing startups that are doing custom prescription ones that you can take an eye test via your phone, via mobile app. They can even scan the shape of your face just from your phone. Imagine a pair of glasses that can act as bifocals without the split in the lens carved specifically to the frame of your face so it fits perfectly. So like we're gonna have more personalization there too. And I, all of that seems great. I will say though that the, the messaging on your eyeglasses, I mean, I can't imagine, I have to wear these so I can't take them off. But you've already talked about how being, getting all of these messages all the time can, isn't this, isn't that, doesn't that conflict with the theory that we want to be disconnected? Oh yeah, because the thing is that uh, we suffer this fear of FOMO, that you're missing out on all things. We have this desire to be hyperconnected, but that hyperconnection leads to a lot of depression and anxiety if you feel like you're missing out on something. Um, I almost like to say that social media is a form of psychic terrorism because every post you see is a reminder of where you were not, what you were not invited to, what you were, you know, you know something left out of, right? And so when you're constantly looking at the highlight reel of everybody else's life, how is that going to make you feel? Does it give you pressure to post more stuff? Does it make you feel like you're left out? And so more and more of my friends I know, I see they're deleting those apps on their phones. So they're only being able to check them on the browser um, or they're removing the notifications. Um, there's a wonderful plugin you should try called Demetricator. It removes the stats on Facebook or Instagram. So it doesn't show view counts, doesn't show number of likes, doesn't show number of friends. And it's interesting the effect it has, almost relief when you don't know the stats. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Okay, hang on, I'm downloading. Um, okay. we, we talk about it and certainly a lot of people are interested and, and focused on these apps, uh, certainly biohacking, and, and you've given us a lot of, of great leads, but what do traditional doctors and even health regulators say about biohacking? I think they would say that, you know, caveat emptor, buyer beware, a lot of these things are unproven. And the fundamental thing, even I found after years of trying this, Go focus on the basics. I call it smile. S, sleep properly. M, meditate, you know, get your mind in check. I, do some intermittent fasting so you're not constantly bombarding your system with food too much. L, have loving relationships with your friends and family. E, exercise, move around. That's really boring though. And the problem is biohackers, we want, you know, three ways to instantly cut whatever, whatever. We're looking for silver bullet shortcuts because humans want that. We hate doing the work. And the truth is if you just focus on healthy fundamentals, the rest will come. In fact, there might even be a case where if you've got these smile-based five healthy habits in place, you don't need to take NAD supplements and, and all these other things. And if you do, your body's already producing them through healthy habits. You might be harming your body because you might be over supplementing and telling your body, don't make that stuff. I'm taking exogenous uh, supplements for that, right? So that's my lesson in all of this. And I think health professionals and traditional experts would say the same, focus on the basics, have a healthy lifestyle. You don't need to do all this advanced hacking stuff. And unfortunately, that's not what the Valley wants to hear. We love shortcuts. We love prescriptions. We love so-and-so's famous morning routine. Like if aliens visit the planet tomorrow, somebody in the audience would be like, what's your morning routine? You know, so. <laughs> I like the idea that aliens are going to visit the planet tomorrow. I mean, that's, that's the most exciting part. Right. Okay. So you've mentioned a lot of these uh, ideas and certainly things to look forward to, but what are some other things that maybe consumers can watch for at least in the coming year? In the coming year, I think we're going to see a backlash against tech products designed to get you addicted. This is something I'm very passionate about. The truth is, we might look back and say, you know what, maybe the internet shouldn't be free and ad-based. Because if it is, then the natural incentive is for everyone to try to hijack your attention, to build apps, services, media that has no stopping cues, that is designed to get you hooked as long as possible to be able to show you advertising um, or to get you, you know, program your impulse to buy more products. So I think we're going to see a backlash against this sort of business model, which is out to hijack our attention. And get this, I think you might even see AI bot warfare. What I mean by that, corporations, publishers, advertisers, they've been using bots to optimize and maximize your attention, basically program your behavior. We'll probably see a rise of bots and AI that serves as the consumer's advocate to counter hack those other AIs that are being used to try to program your attention. It's almost like cognitive warfare assisted by technology, right? The average consumer stands no chance of having their cognitive abilities or attention intact when everybody, Facebook, Google, Netflix, Amazon, etc., is using all these advanced AI bot machine learning tools to basically program influence their perception. 
Interesting stuff. And I love this idea of biohacking. And Tim, you're certainly a great resource for that. If somebody wants to connect with you, Tim Chang, partner at Mayfield Fund, mm -hmm. how can they do that? Uh, my Twitter is time change. It's my name with ease. I figured it used to be a typo. I said, I'm going to own it. And then people curse at me twice a year during when the time change slips. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so it's at time change at Twitter. You can DM me or follow me there. Perfect. Love it. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.